Okay, everyone. I am thrilled to introduce one of our distinguished alumni, Oliver Hameson, uh, who got his PhD uh, from here in, in the Department of Informatics. Uh, we were reminiscing over the last couple of days of various experiences that we, we've had together over the years. Um, we did karaoke in, uh, it was in New York, though CSCW was in New Jersey last that year. So we took the train over together and, and did bar karaoke in New York. And Oliver's been in a couple of bands over the years that he'd be excited to tell you about, including with other scholars in our community. Um, and today he's going to be talking to us uh, about trans technologies and, and a little bit about his uh, book that's coming out. Is it later this year or next year? Next year. Next year from MIT Press on the topic. So uh, let's do it. Oliver, warm welcome. Thank you so much. And thanks to everyone who's put work into organizing today. I really appreciate all of that. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited to be back here uh, and to be able to talk to you about some of the things from my book that's going to be coming out soon. Um, but before I get into research stuff, I just felt like, wait, I have to, okay. I felt like I should share uh, my PhD journey here at UC Irvine. <laughs> this is a photo. I don't know if any of you students got to stay at the Atrium Hotel when we did visiting days, but that's what, where I was on the left in the balcony there. And then this on the right is when I graduated and I was in a hotel next to the Atrium Hotel, which overlooked the very balcony that I was on in the first picture. Um, and you may notice that I look a little bit different between the two photos. Uh, Paul Durish also noticed that. <laughs> unfortunately, he couldn't be here today to enjoy this joke, but I'm sure you all will tell him about it so he can watch on video. Um, uh, <laughs> so um, on a completely different topic, the way I always start these talks, um, I feel it's necessary to contextualize what's going on with trans rights in the US in particular, because I know that I kind of notice this stuff all the time, but I don't know to what extent people in the wider audience do actually see these types of news stories. But really, every time I give a talk, I look at what the most recent news is, and I know there's going to be something terrible. And then I just share, you know, the most recent things to kind of contextualize the political climate that I'm giving this talk in. And uh, so you'll see these two stories. The first one about uh, trans adults are on edge as the legislature is brought in focus beyond children. So I'm sure, sure you've heard a lot of these uh, laws are restricting access to gender affirming healthcare for people under 18. Uh, that is now expanding in some states to people that are adults. Ohio is the most recent state to put a lot of restrictions on trans healthcare in their state. Uh, this one on the right here is a case in Colorado where someone, an adult person was canceled to get a gen, uh, the, they were scheduled to get a gender affirming surgery. It was then canceled because the hospital decided to stop offering those types of procedures entirely. And the ACLU is now suing them for discrimination because they actually do perform those procedures if you are a cisgender man, for instance, who uh, wants to have some extra breast tissue removed. Um, that's fine. It's just that they don't do these procedures specifically for trans people. And these are just some of the newest laws that have been passed in uh, Utah is the most recent state to require trans people or require all people to use the bathroom only that corresponds to their uh, sex assigned at birth, like on their birth certificate in all um, public schools and government owned buildings. So this is really opening up a place for people to restrict or to police each other's genders. And I think this has a lot of wide ranging implications, not just for trans people, but also for cisgender people. Um, and I just wanna know like a, a law like this would effectively mean that someone like me would have to use the women's restroom, which I don't think is something that a lot of people would actually want, especially me. And so this, 
kind of law, I know it sounds like it's just about bathrooms, but it effectively bans trans people from public life. Because if you can't go out and use the restroom somewhere, you can't really um, exist in the world. Um, so this slide is kind of about the impact that this is having. Uh, so there was a recent early report from the most recent US trans survey. It had a sample size of 90,000 trans people in, in the US and half of them have considered moving out of state because of anti-trans or anti-LGBTQ laws in their state. Half of them, 5% have actually moved out of their state. So if you think about like, obviously not 100% of trans people live in states that have anti-trans discrimination. So, you know, the sample size of people that are in restrictive states is already, you know, not 100%. So this is like a pretty high number. People are actually having to leave their lives, their homes, their jobs, their families uh, to move to different states. And this one on the right, more than half of black trans youth have considered suicide in the past year. Um, so that's considered, the, the other statistic is that 20% had actually attempted suicide. So these things have real impacts on real people. Um, and this is, I think, a really dire political situation that I'm not sure is getting too much attention. Um, so in California, you know, I always have a slide of like, whether things like in the state that we're currently in, and the last time I gave this talk was in Georgia, and it uh, was significantly worse <laughs> than, than these ones. So, you know, California did pass a lot of LGBTQ protections recently, things like privacy for trans youth, increasing all gender restrooms in schools and businesses, allowing document changes, things like this. Um, and University of California campuses are seeing a dramatic rise in students who are trans and non-binary. I think it was like three times as many in the past several years, something like that. Um, so on the surface, things look like pretty good for people in California, right? But there's also this, apparently there's a ballot initiative right now that's titled uh, Restricting Rights of Transgender Youth Initiative, which seems like a pretty accurate title because it's trying to restrict things like gender affirming care, requiring that uh, schools tell parents about any you know, name changes or pronoun changes that students are experimenting with or, or using in classrooms. Um, and then there's a parent, parent group that's very upset about it's being called restricting rights of transgender youth initiative. So um, clearly there's some tension happening even in the great state of California. Um, and the context that uh, I am talking about trans technology today is in this greater political climate that I think is very important to start grounding this work. And when I talk about trans technology, I have two different definitions of that, but I wanna start out with this more practical definition of technology that addresses the needs and challenges faced by trans people in communities. And it's often designed in response to this lack of trans inclusion in a lot of more mainstream technologies. So I wanna give some examples that are responding to this anti-trans legislative crisis that we have right now. In response to this, a lot of people started building technology that would help in some way. And this one is from the Transformations Project. It's basically a database that you can search online for the different bills that are either proposed or have passed in different states. And it's really helpful just to get a sense of how many there are, where they are happening, whether they are passing, all of that. This next one I think is really cool. Um, it's called Trans Family Network. And this was in response to some of the very first really bad laws were in the state of Texas. And this group of people that built this trans family network app, they actually met on Twitter. So they were you know, a group of mostly trans women who were living mostly in Silicon Valley, you know, working as software engineers, very kind of um, uh, high socioeconomic status, more privileged uh, trans people. But they were very concerned with what was happening in Texas. A lot of families were being forced to leave because you know, they could actually be um, 
prosecuted for enabling their children to receive gender affirming care. So families were needing to, to move out of Texas. And a lot of them needed help for various things like financial support, transportation, um, uh, you know, place to stay, all of these different things. And there were a lot of people who wanted to provide that help, but there wasn't a good way of connecting those people with each other. And the more important part is really vetting those people. So initially they were just using this spreadsheet that was just shared on Twitter. Anyone could access it. And you know that put people in a pretty vulnerable situation if they were needing help and um, putting their information on the spreadsheet. So this group of developers got together and within two weeks, they actually, many of them took two weeks off of work. They created this trans family network app that would connect people in need with people who could support them in some way. And they did a lot of uh, very rigorous vetting to make sure that people would stay safe. Other trans technologies that have emerged in this political climate include some of these maps that will map out the US in terms of how safe or not safe certain states are. So the one on the left is from 2023, and this is LGBTQ plus legislation more broadly. The one on the right um, is made by Aaron Reed, who's a pretty prominent trans activist and also a participant in my research study. And she puts out these maps every few months to update us on the current state. And you can see that uh, Florida, for instance, is a really dangerous place. It's actually considered a place that trans people should not travel to based on this particular um, mapping of different legislation. And then there are also some efforts like this one. This is um, TTRPGs, that's tabletop role-playing games. This is um, for trans rights in Florida. So they're trying to raise money on this platform called Itch.io, which is a place where a lot of game designers and game developers um, and different times, types of uh, artists will share their work and be able to reach a wider audience. And they were able to raise almost $300,000 at the time when I took this screenshot. So there's lots of different ways you can see that people are using technology in some way to address some of these really difficult challenges that trans people and communities are facing in the US. And what I'm going to be talking about today is excerpts from my forthcoming book uh, that will be coming out next year. Um, and before I go further, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, my collaborators. This is um, not only from the book project, but also from, from some of the uh, participatory design work we've been doing around this and some of the earlier research that informed um, this trans technology work. You might see some familiar faces from UC Irvine. Oh, and it also includes some of the co-PIs on, on a NSF grant that we have on this research. So the methods for this study, uh, we did 104 interviews with 115 creators of trans technology. And so that just means that some of them, there were multiple people in the same interview if multiple designers or creators from a technology wanted to uh, talk. And it was basically just contacting people from a list that we had created of different trans technologies that uh, myself and my research team have been tracking for a number of years. Also included a digital ethnography where uh, we used some of the technologies from the data set, um, also followed them on social media, uh, signed up for email lists, and then attended the Trans Tech Summit. It's a, it was an online conference um, in 2022 and 2023. And then for data analysis, it was mostly a reflexive thematic analysis. So I mentioned before that I have two definitions of trans technology. And this is the first one, this practical definition of technology that addresses the needs and challenges faced by trans people in communities. But there's also a more theoretical definition here that has to do more with uh, trans as kind of a theoretical concept. So this is thinking about technology that embraces change and transition, has potential to create new trans worlds and opens up new possibilities for what technology means and what it can do. So I'll give some examples of that throughout the talk as well. Um, 
But when I talk about trans technology, I'm really grounding the meanings in these interviews that I did with creators. So um, there were lots of different ways that people categorized or, or tried to talk about what this means to them. Um, and these are all of the different categories. So there's some practical meanings, theoretical meanings, and then some that were related to design processes themselves. Um, and all of them work typically community centric in some way. So I'm not gonna be able to go through all of these in the talk today, but I just wanted to give the sense of what are all the different types of meanings here. And then in terms of the technologies and the data set, all kinds of different stuff. So there were apps and websites and kind of more traditional uh, digital technologies like that. Also things like um, AR, VR and supplies and podcasts, oral history projects. Uh, lots and lots of different things. This is just a small selection of the different technologies that I was interested in. And in the talk today, I'm going to go through these primary arguments from my book. So the first is that creating trans technology can be really powerful and empowering because technology creators have this agency to create the tools that they themselves and their communities need to navigate the world. But a lot of times, when trans communities are not involved in these design processes, that can lead to this overly individualistic design that speaks more to more privileged trans people's needs. Uh, and that's because a lot of the creators in uh, the data set and just in general in the world of trans technology tend to be more white, they tend to be um, more educated, higher socioeconomic status, et cetera, than the trans population overall. And so I'm arguing that trans technology creation can have most impact and best address trans needs if community members are meaningfully involved in design processes. So throughout the book and throughout the talk, there's this notion of ambivalence that comes up again and again. And when I talk about ambivalence, what I mean is these tensions between these competing goals and desires that trans tech creators often experience simultaneously. So basically, I mean, there are two things that seem like they're in contrast or tension, and it's not that one has to be true over the other, it's that they are both actually true at the same time. And creators often would uh, feel somewhat conflicted because two of these things could be true at the same time. So the individualistic and community-based design methods, privileged and inclusive trans technology design, capitalist and anti-capitalist approaches and thinking about utopian and dystopian trans futures. So these fluctuations, they often would complicate the uh, trans technology design processes. And this partially explains why the landscape of trans technologies that exist doesn't actually perfectly match onto the types of needs that it could address. And for ambivalence, I want to give this example. So this first one here on the left, for, these are both in 2022. The one on the left is from March. This is from July. Both from the same person, Sasha Winter, who was one of the uh, participants in the study. And I should mention that most of the participants wanted to specifically be identified. So that's why I'm using their real names. And some of them I won't be using their real names if they didn't want that. Um, but in this case, she did want to be identified. So she created this um, game jam on itch.io, which basically just means a bunch of people uh, are invited to participate and just make a game that goes along with some specific theme over a period of time. So in this really frustrating anti-trans political climate, Sasha started this trans fucking rage jam and it was extremely popular. I think there were, um, I don't know how many, I think it was like around a hundred different, uh, different games that were created. Um, but then later in the year, this was a, like in July, a few months later, same person created the trans joy jam, right? So these are both kind of existing at once. It's not that trans people were so angry in March and April, and then in July and August, they were suddenly filled with joy. Like that's <laughs> totally not what was going on here. It's that rage and joy can exist at the same time. And uh, that's what I mean when I'm talking about this ambivalence. This is just one example of that. 
And another contribution, another kind of thread that goes through a lot of this work is what I'm calling technological trans care. And what I mean by that is trans people creating innovative technological mechanisms to support each other, address the needs that they and their communities face in the world when mainstream systems and technologies reject or exclude them. So this is related to uh, Hill Melatino's concept of trans care, um, but it's a little different because trans care is typically thought about as like a one-to-one -one mechanism where you know someone is taking care of another person after surgery. But with technology, it can be really one-to-many and it can reach wide audiences. And this is a way for trans people to fight against some of these discriminatory and hostile systems and political environments. Um, and this is a, a image I made with AI. So we can see how like, there's a person walking around with no face. There's a robot emerging from some sort of potted plant. Mm -hmm. So these, uh, these are some of the things AI thinks about technological trans care, but didn't actually come up in the data. So first part of the argument is creating trans tech can be potential, uh, potentially very powerful and empowering because people have agency to create the tools that they and their communities need to navigate the world. So a lot of times people are really drawing from their own experiences and that can be really empowering if you're someone who identifies a need and then you can just use skills that you have to create technology to build something that can help you and potentially help other people uh, in your community. Um, and so I'll give a few examples of this. So this is from Dr. Jerrica Kirkley, who created Plume, which is a, a pretty uh, popular um, trans telehealth service. So she said, I'm a trans person myself. I have the privilege of being a physician, actually knowing how the system works for the most part. And I still had struggles of my own in navigating some of this and getting the services that I needed. So that is really where it was all born out of. Um, so, this was really related in a lot of ways to her own personal identity and some of the needs that she had identified. She created this service that was then very useful for so many other people. This one is from Erin Reed, who I mentioned earlier. Uh, she created this tool called Erin's Informed Consent uh, Hormone Replacement Therapy Map. And she was describing here her own experience. She says, I was 30 and was trying to find a hormone therapy clinic and didn't know if I could find one. My struggles definitely made me realize, is there really not a place where I can just go online and look for the nearest informed consent location to me? No, there wasn't, it didn't exist at all. And so just in dealing with those frustrations, I wanted to make this one day. I wanted to make sure that people don't have to go through all this bullshit one day. So she was able to exercise her agency to enable people all across the US and even some beyond the US to find healthcare providers that are near them that would help them move forward in their medical transition journeys. So this is a form of what I'm calling technological trans care here. And this is a um, quote from Anna, who's a, this is a pseudonym for a participant who did want to remain anonymous. And she talked about, she was a young trans person and she identified problems that trans people were facing in the world, and she didn't want to just kind of wait around for solutions to appear. So she says, I came out when I was eight and very few trans resources whatsoever were around. So there was this huge need. I didn't feel supported. So I would need an online resource. There were also thousands of other young trans people who would need that online um, resource as well. And so she was living in a very rural area of the US and there were not really resources available to her. And so in the second part of the quote here, she says, so I worked with some friends that I knew from the internet and we started this uh, educational resource for trans young people. I'm one of the two co-founders. We were both 16 year old trans girls at the time. We didn't know how big it was gonna grow or how long it was gonna last and it's still running strong. So in addition to creating this trans technology when she was 16, she also created her own webpage when she was eight years old. And um, it was kind of interesting because she said, you know, I created my own personal web page when I was eight, you know, as many young trans women do. <laughs> I'm like, I don't, I don't know if that is accurate, but um, she kind of felt like it was not a big thing. Um, but, you know, this is just a really nice example of someone who obviously was very skilled at a very young age and could, could really use that agency to 
create something that was helpful to meet her needs and other people like her. Um, and then this is going back to the trans family network that I talked about earlier. Uh, this is a person that was not trying to help herself. She was trying to help other trans people by using her own relative privilege within the trans community to create technology that would help people who might not have the skills or resources or time to do so. So she said, it's not so much, I imagine myself there, I imagine that happening to someone I care about and I have the power to fix it. So I'm going to fix it. So this is someone who's a software engineer, right? She's used to fixing things with software and computer code. And so it was really just natural to her to think about fixing parts of this anti-trans legislative crisis to increase resources for people. Uh, and then this is a quote uh, that's talking about a tool that would help trans patients communicate their preferences for nipple placement after a gender affirming mastectomy or top surgery. So in practice, a lot of different surgeons have kind of their own um, methods, their own standard ways of where they place nipples or what the scars are gonna look like. But instead, Gaines was thinking about this, uh, this tool that would allow the patient to experiment with this nipple placement scar shape and things like that. Uh, he says, I think it should be a sim style applet with sliders and you can slide the nipple slider, the scar to be curvier, straight or higher or lower. So this is a tool that really can help increase the agency that trans people have over their health care. So rather than receiving some kind of default top surgery, they would be able to show the surgeon what they would want it to look like. So the second part of the argument is that when trans communities are not involved in uh, design processes, they, this can lead to this overly individualistic design that speaks primarily to more privileged trans people's needs. So um, you'll see in some of these quotes, a lot of times when people are designing for themselves, they're also designing for people that are a lot similar to, to them. Like, And since they were more likely to be white, more likely to be a higher socioeconomic status, more highly educated. This has this potential to exclude more marginalized communi uh, community members like people of color, people with uh, lower socioeconomic status, uh, things like that. So sometimes when people are doing such individual design, it doesn't speak to the needs in the trans population more broadly. So a lot of these trans tech design processes were really solo endeavors. So they weren't um, using community-based design approaches or anything like that. And this can create trans tech that's really individualistic. So this example of an app called Patch Day, the creator said, initial prototyping was zero care about anyone but myself. I'm a new coder. I need to just have something working. This is a fun project for me. I didn't do the whole investigating other people's uh, problems. So this lack of community input, this means, you know, this might work well for other trans people that are not, you know, young white trans women like this creator, um, but we don't really know because she didn't do any type of like user testing or requirements gathering or um, involving other community members in any way. Um, this one is a quote about creating this really formative online trans resource. Uh, I decided to anonymize this person um, because she was just so forthright in her motivations about building this tech for people that she views as similar to herself. And I didn't wanna kind of drag her publicly, so I decided to just anonymize her, but this is a white trans woman. And she said, I wanted to help the people who are kind of like me, who are college educated, competitive and white color fields, because I knew if enough of them were able to keep their jobs and thrive, that we would be able to support things like artists and political activists and lobbying groups and things like that. So that was my grand scheme. So I was trying to make it for everybody, but I was really focused on people who I was most easily able to help. So to me, if I'm doing a close reading of this quote, this carries this assumption that trans people who are not like her, who are not college educated <laughs> and white are not as capable of helping themselves, which I feel like she has this um, the idea of what is a respectable way to transition. And that's kind of who she is designing for. And she's making a lot of, I think, harmful assumptions here about more marginalized trans people. 
And because she's explicitly saying this, I think this is also built into the design of this resource site. And so it definitely does have this potential to exclude some of the resources that might be more helpful to trans people who are not white and well-educated and affluent. So some of the trans tech creators, especially who were kind of more privileged, were self-aware actually about how their privilege could shape their tools and could bake in some bias and exclusion or things like that. This is an example from KJ Rothson who created the Digital Transgender Archive. And he said, we're recognizing the ways that the Digital Transgender Archive is slanted towards otherwise privileged factions of trans communities in ways that you can probably readily anticipate. I'm sure that the DTA doesn't always feel like everyone's resource. Uh, so it was actually really nice to hear from some of these creators that did care about these things and did acknowledge privilege, things like that, and describe how they might have some blind spots in their design. Uh, and this was in contrast to some of the creators like the one I showed on the previous slide where they had similar limitations, but they left them unaddressed and unstated. And so you can see in the Digital Transgender Archive, there's a few photos here. I'm not sure how well you can view, but this is saying a photograph of Vicky by a staircase, a photograph of two people posing outside. And these are uh, from the early 1960s. Uh, these are all white uh, trans women or cross-dressers, it looks like. And so a lot of the, um, the things in the trans archive just are more likely to be of white um, white people, but they do actually do quite a bit to try to increase inclusion of people of color because they do recognize that limitation there. So the third part of the argument is that trans tech creation can actually have the most impact and best address trans needs if community members are meaningfully involved in design processes. So I'm gonna give a few examples of cases where creators actually did involve community members in a, a really um, meaningful way. This is from uh, the Creative Futures Project. This was a group of creators that worked with trans young people to create virtual reality art for immersive storytelling, and it eventually became two films. So these are uh, some screenshots from those films. And uh, the creator Dylan Paré says the linear film would tell the story of how these youth came up with their ideas of what stories they wanted to tell, what they were hoping people would learn from their projects. And then the 360 film was where you actually can go into the art with them and they tell you about their art that they've created and what it means for them. So this project enabled Perry to tell more diverse trans stories using this really innovative medium. And at the same time, it was a way to teach VR skills to trans young people. Here's another example. This is from uh, Guilherme Pereira and his collaborators uh, in Brazil. They were using participatory design methods over a period of more than six months to create what they called LGB Trust, which is an app to help increase safety for trans and queer people in Brazil. So uh, he had a series of design workshops with this population and participants were really involved throughout the process. And at the beginning, he didn't really have a sense of what he and the design workshop participants would be creating, but he left that really up to the participants. So he said, this is very deeply related to all these concerns about violence in Brazil. So it was natural to talk about and to think about safety, how to create a safe place, to share about what places you should be careful, where you should not go, but it was not given by me. It was not my choice at the beginning. It was just the natural development of the process. So this was a human-centered design process in which Pereira learned along with the participants that safety was a primary concern for them. And so the technology design really should focus on safety. So I think this was a nice example of including people in the process. So going back to these three primary arguments, so I've shown how uh, trans tech design can be really powerful because people have the agency to create the technology that they need for themselves and for their communities. But sometimes when they don't include people from the broader 
trans community. This can be this really individualistic design process that speaks to some of the more privileged trans people's needs. Um, and then it can actually have most impact if trans technology is addressing trans needs that come from the larger population of trans community members by involving them in design processes. So how can we actually think about trying to address these inequalities? So we know that um, trans perspectives and lived experiences enable reworking and rethinking of how technology design can benefit trans people. And what can we actually do here though? Because despite this, empowering and potentially liberatory potential of trans technology, many of the trans technologies that actually best employ this human-centered design approach, the technology was never actually deployed. So going back to Guilherme Pereira, uh, there was this important tension here, right? Because he did this really um, well-constructed human-centered design process, but then wasn't able to actually deploy the app. So he said, it was like a prototype deployment. I had most of these functionalities working so people could ask for help, people could post things, it would appear in the map, people could ask for any other kind of support and this kind of stuff. I think that in the end, and this is something that really frustrated me at the time, for you to be able to deploy an app, you need a lot of money and you need a lot of people working with you. So this is a safety app, right? So it really has to work very well. It can't really have any issues when it's deployed. And so he wasn't able to do that work of actually deploying the technology because he didn't have the resources and the time available to do that. And he mentioned that participants were also pretty disappointed that the app wasn't fully deployed. Um, so I obviously don't have a great you know, solution that's gonna fix all these problems, but I do have some things to think about, suggestions for moving uh, community-based trans technology more towards deployment. So uh, the way I think of it is we need some matching programs here to match up the people who are um, have all these great ideas of trans technology that should be created, the communities that they need to include in the design processes, the people who have the skills to actually not just create, but to actually deploy and maintain these technologies. Um, so all of these kind of need to be matched together, and right now they're not. So I'm thinking about ways of bringing designs from classrooms and academic research to deployment. So for instance, with Pereira, he's actually an HCI scholar, um, and he had some academic publications out of this, but he didn't really have the resources to be able to bring this out of academia and deploy it. Um, we could set up matching programs for trans tech designers and developers connecting tech creators with community members. And then I think it's also important to make more space for publishing on tech deployment and user studies, because um, a lot of times when academics and people who are doing these processes, which the human-centered design processes are more likely to happen in academic context, because we're the ones who I think actually like care about doing these design processes in this way. Um, but then our incentives are based on publications. So it's sometimes I've had a lot of trouble publishing papers that are about deployments of technologies because sometimes there's not some big theoretical contribution there. I've also thought about what are the gaps here and what do we still need to fill? So this table is showing, um, this is just three of the categories of trans, uh, challenges that that um, my research team and I came up with, uh, just as an example. But this first column here is the types of trans technologies that currently address these challenges. The second column is ways trans technologies could help address this challenge to some extent. And then the third column is aspects that are not really possible to address with technology that are more systemic issues. So the first one is access to society. So we do have restroom finder apps. That's one type of trans technology that does exist. Um, there could though also be more technologies that could make physical spaces uh, safer and more inclusive. But with technology, we're not really gonna be able to solve the systemic issues here, things like transphobia. Um, 
as another example, this third one here around financial challenges and employment, the type of transect that currently exists here, I have a screenshot of it here, it's called um, Bliss, and it's a trans banking app. So it's, and the tagline here is better banking for transgender souls. So this is like, you know, no, nobody ever asked for trans banking, to be honest. <laughs> like this, <laughs> this is not something that's going to actually, I think, solve any problems. Like we don't need a trans specific bank. Um, what we do need, I think, is technologies that match people with jobs, match people with skill training, make workplaces more inclusive. Like these are all things that technology could make some inroads into. Um, but in the end, in column C here, technology is not going to actually address these financial disparities, hiring discrimination, workplace discrimination, and poverty. So this is kind of my way of coming up with some ideas of ways that trans tech could help fill the gaps more but while at the same time acknowledging that technology is not gonna solve some of these larger societal issues. So in conclusion, this work really illuminate, illuminates, I think, two things. So first, technology helps us imagine new possibilities for trans people and communities. So the examples I have up here, uh, trans family network that I talked about earlier, and this is a, a site called Mod Club, which is like a, um, online community for trans men and uh, trans masculine people to share surgery photos. And so these are like new worlds, new possibilities that are now available with technology. And at the same time, trans experiences really help us imagine new possibilities for technology. So the examples here, I didn't get a chance to talk about as much in this talk, but this First one is a way of augmenting your face to enable multiple identities on Apple ID. So that to me feels like a very trans technology. And this other one is um, creating DNA phenotyping to represent the face of someone who can't physically be seen. So the example here is Chelsea Manning, who's a trans woman who was imprisoned and there were no photographs of her um, after she transitioned because she was in prison that entire time. And, she was not allowed to have any photographers in there. A magazine wanted to do an article about Chelsea Manning and they wanted an image to go with it. And so they hired this artist named Heather Dewey Hagborg to create a DNA phenotype of Chelsea Manning's face, what it might look like based on her DNA. And so uh, Dewey Hagborg and Manning collaborated on this project where um, Manning provided the DNA and the um, hair samples, things like that. And then they created a bunch of different faces of like what she might possibly look like. Um, and the, the art exhibit was called uh, Possibly Chelsea. And I think that's also a really kind of trans way of thinking about technology. Um, and I've been thinking about this in the, co in the um, context of Catherine Malibu, she's a philosopher. She has this concept of plasticity. So, it means that things are both malleable, so they take form from other things, and at the same time, they're able to change their surroundings. So they're able to give form, such as something like plastic arts or plastic surgery. So this is a little bit more complicated than just saying flexible or elastic or something like that, um, because that means that like you stretch something and maybe then it goes back to what it is before. But this is more about uh, things changing the world and being changed by the world at the same time. So been thinking about this intersection between trans uh, studies and HCI and what we might call trans technology studies. And I think some of the main facets that th this needs to include are designed for change and transition. So I think that's a fundamental part of trans studies. And already in HCI, we have a lot of work about designing for marginality rather than desire, designing for an average user. Um, and this uh, trans technology studies also helps us understand these complexities that arise when design processes are really personally meaningful and when the designer is often part of the user group. Um, and you can see here again, AI's conception of what this might look like where we're all kind of crowded around a weird castle with screens all over the place. Um, and then also 
And going back to what I was saying earlier about ambivalence, so I think there's potential for uh, trans studies and HCI to embrace this ambivalence and multiplicity rather than trying to simplify things. So a lot of times when you read about ambivalence, people are trying to resolve it. And I don't think we should resolve it. I think we should just, it's okay for there to be multiple conflicting things true at the same time. Um, one example of this is technology to address people's needs and desires, right? So there's this kind of turn towards like more joy-based HCI. Um, and I think that's a little simple because joy always is in the context of people still having challenges and needs that need to be addressed. So by ambivalent HCI, I would, I would call this HCI that recognizes and studies how multiple seemingly conflicting truths can exist simultaneously. Um, so that is it for my talk and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Yeah, Erin. Yeah, thanks for the wonderful talk. Um, so I have a question that comes directly from place of ignorance. So um, you're better to figure out if you can elaborate on something. Um, but you talked about um, the needs of um, trans folk in higher socioeconomic positions compared to lower socioeconomic positions. I guess I was curious what those different needs might be. Sure, yeah. So I'll give an example of um, one of the people that I talked with was part of this group called we are the ones we've been waiting for. And they were really like based in, I think kind of lower socioeconomic status groups of uh, trans people of color in the Bay Area. And their main trans technology was a self-defense kit. So it was specifically meant for um, black and brown trans women and trans femmes. And it was like this really cool self-defense kit that like, it looked super cute. Like they had this photo on Instagram of, you know, um, I think it was like a in the shape of a cat head, but there were pointy ears, so you could like you know defend yourself. So it was like um, that's something that's a very real need, I think, for people who are in less safe situations. That is not as likely to be needed for for someone like maybe who lives in Irvine, I guess. Um, and <laughs> no offense to <laughs> uh, for the like. Um, for the higher socioeconomic side, I mean, I guess like the resource website that I gave as a, an example. So if someone is, you know, maybe they're not even involved in trans community that much, maybe they just want some information and they don't really want to um, get involved in community. They just want to kind of transition on their own and they can find a resource website online that is probably targeted towards them. Thank you. Yes. Hi. Uh, this is really interesting. So, um, so I'm kind of not sure this is it, but I wonder uh, after a real song about this, there's kind of like innovations where like dogs they can um, consider or um, advocate to um, the our divine or research that is not active for trans people. Oh, how, can you repeat the last part of the question? How we can... Um... So how can we can, um, do you have any thoughts or like, suggestions that we can adopt or integrate, integrate to um, our everyday design and research that is not active for trans people? So maybe in other sure. words, how can we make the, the ordinary technology uh, became more power to a trans technology? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And I think that brings up something that came up quite a bit in the book, but I didn't get to talk about as much today, which is um, there's kind of, oh, sure. Yeah. So the question is, how can we uh, integrate some of what we've learned about trans technologies into the kind of more mainstream world of technologies? Is that Accurate. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. So I think that there's this tension between, um, on one hand, you can work really hard to um, integrate, uh, you know, trans inclusive measures across more mainstream technologies. Um, and then on the other hand, you can 
work to create new technologies that will be fundamentally embody trans values from the outset. Um, and most of the technologies in the book were more in this second camp, right? But I think what you're asking about is, you know, more mainstream technologies and how those can be more trans inclusive. Um, and I think that there's lots of ways that that can be done. And even some of the, the trans tech in this book was like, for instance, online communities that take place on a platform like Discord or something like that, where um, Discord is not necessarily trans technology itself, but it does have certain features that allow people to feel safe in an online community with other trans people. Um, and I think that a lot of the things that I've been talking about today, so this notion of ambivalence, um, and uh, technological trans care, things like that could in some ways be incorporated into mainstream platforms. So, you know, if they recognize that, like for instance, people's identities are, are changing over time. And that's one thing I've, you know, been saying for years is how um, mainstream social media sites don't really look at people as changing and they kind of expect this static uh, user identity. And the more we can change that, I think that's helpful for anybody that's going through life transitions. Um, and that makes it incredibly more inclusive for trans people. And there's lots of things I think, I think like that, but I think they're a lot easier to incorporate into a new technology where you can actually build it with those values fundamentally embedded. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, I was wondering uh, more on the lines of like thinking about like methodology um, and how we can incorporate these like ideas of um, trans technologies, trans tech values, or especially like things like ambivalence and what have you, how that in can inform or influence the ways in which we as researchers or technologists or designers can go about um, design. Oh uh, yeah, great question um, from Ria about how we can incorporate some of these ideas like um, ambivalence and things like that into research and design. Is that, is that right? Yeah. So I think that I mean sometimes one thing I hear when you're learning how to do interviews, for instance, is uh, oh try asking the question a few times different ways and you'll get to like the truth of the matter, right? Because sometimes you have interviews and someone's saying something that contradicts what they're saying earlier. And I think an ambivalent approach would be to say, there is not one truth. It's both of these are true. At the same time, we have to learn how to um, understand that this phenomenon is, is that complex, that there are multiple contradicting things true. Um, so that would be one. In terms of design, I mean, I think the more participatory approaches that we take are, are probably the way to um, create designs that are going to be more aligned with with what people actually want and need. So, you know, like the work that we've been doing and stuff like that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Bo. Thanks, thank you for the talk. Um, I was just gonna, to build off of that, ask if you could speak a little bit about the community participatory work that you've all been doing in Michigan and, and how that may be builds from or relates to the idea of the Oh yeah, thank you so much. So the question is about um, how we've been building off of this work with our current participatory design work. Um, yeah, so we've been doing a series of participatory design workshops. Um, a lot of them have been led by Ria, so thanks Ria, and also um, Kat Brewster, who's a postdoc in my lab now and graduated from here. Um, and one approach we've been using is zine making. So we, you know, bring a lot of cool supplies and people. Um, kind of work through uh, ideas that they might have for futuristic technologies. And one uh, particular area we've been focusing in on is augmented reality. Um, and the reason for that is because in previous participatory design sessions, that was something that came up a lot. So without people saying that, those words, obviously, but um, they would think about uh, mirrors and glasses and things that could augment the physical world. And so we decided to really lean into that um, that kind of approach and ask, like, you know, tell people what augmented reality is, give them the opportunity to design and think about uh, future augmented reality that could be specifically trans technology. Um, and so that's been really 
exciting and um, fun work. And we have a lot of ideas for cool things that we're actually in the beginning stages of building right now. So that's, that's gonna be exciting to get those out into the world and really trying to take this community-based approach to, to building rather than just saying, um, oh, here's something that, you know, I think would help me. So we like ask lots of people. Um, yeah, and I think that that um, allows us to include some of this ambivalence and include, you know, a lot of the complexity that is inherent in trans experiences. Okay, well, it's exactly three o'clock. So. Yep, we can take the, the conversation outside to the reception. Thank all of you more time. Thank you. Yeah. You brought me back to like I don't know, last time I heard you give a talk, but then all the years here right. too. Like, we both got the so first good. Oh, good. You always got <laughs> amazing. Like, just the way you present your presentation. Like we just had all such yeah. compelling and engaging your moves throughout your time. And I haven't heard one for a long time. So anyways, I'll let you socialize.